Indeed, it is a great honor, a privilege for me to be invited to take part in this milestone in the history of not only this district, but also this church. 30 years. 30 years. It's critical because it marks the transition from one generation to another. So as we look in the past, we celebrate what God has done. But we are also at the crossroads. As we look forward, we can rely on the past to see that God has been good to us. That God has been faithful. And our faith and our hope is that, oh Lord, just as you have done in the last 30 years, do it again. Do it again. But you know what? For this morning, I wanted to focus more on what get us going in a different, in a new trajectory. If this church exists, I, can, I don't know the whole story. I can hardly wait to hear the speech, how it started. But I have no doubt that some lonely people, maybe one, maybe two, maybe three, got God's vision. Nothing of this kind existed and said we are launching by faith. We believe that God is about to do a new thing. And my prayer this morning is that, again, we may inspire a new generation that will stand on the shoulders of those who have gone before us and see even further away and say, Lord, we trust you. We are going to launch out in a new phase, in a new chapter of the church, and you do even greater things for your glory and honor. And the text I've chosen is quite unique, particular, unexpected. But I believe that the Lord wants to speak to us through that text. So I invite you to turn with me to the text of Luke chapter 10. We'll start from verse 25. It's still the NIV version, but I, I, I realize that we don't have the same year, so there will be some differences, but nothing to deter from understanding the text. Luke chapter 10, verse 25 to 37. Quite long, but we'll read it, we'll read through it. On one occasion, an expert in the Lord stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? What is written in the law? He replied. How do you read it? He answered, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and love your neighbor as yourself. You have answered correctly, Jesus replied. Do this and you will leave. But he wanted to justify himself, so he asked Jesus, And who is my neighbor? In reply, Jesus said, A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he was attacked by robbers. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. A priest happened to be going down the same road, and when he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. So too, a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he traveled, came where the man was, and when he saw him, he took pity on him. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. 
Then he put the man on his own donkey, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said, and when I return, I will reimburse you for any extra expense you may have. Which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of robbers? The expert in the law replied, The one who had mercy on him. Jesus told him, Go and do likewise. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we've come before you. We've come before you to celebrate your grace, what you have done, but also to welcome with great expectation what you will do. Father, we've read your word. Now we ask you to give life, new life indeed to your word. May your word speak to us, to revive us, to challenge us, to encourage us, to comfort us. Speak to us, Father. Humble your servant so that you and you alone would be glorified. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. As I said, this is an unusual text for a celebration day like today, as we celebrate God's grace at God's, at, at Grace Church. Yet, I do believe that there is a profound connection between the event of the day and the central lesson of the pericarp, which is the invitation to the extra mile. We've done one mile. God is inviting us to the extra mile. That is the message of this text. The story of the Good Samaritan is one of the best known stories in the Bible. We all know that. Around the world, hospitals, rescue centers, and even entire ministries are named after the Good Samaritan. The phenomenon translates the way we've come to read this whole text. For most of us, the text of the Good Samaritan, or the story of the Good Samaritan, is about being merciful to strangers. In reality, being merciful to strangers is only one of the implications of the text. It's not the main point of the text. So let us go back to the text itself. The structure of the text is quite simple. It contains a dialogue in two parts. The two parts are introduced by a lead question. There's a lead question. In the first part, the lead question is, Teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Verse 25. What must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus answers the questions by returning the question to the expert in the law who answered Jesus' question. In a gesture that shows excellent teaching skills, Jesus approves of the expert's answer. He tells him, you have answered correctly. Verse 28. Just as one would expect an end to the story, putting the question to rest, he has answered correctly. The expert in the law brings up a second question, and that's the lead question of the second part. And he asks, who is my neighbor? Verse 29. It is in this context that Jesus tells the story of the man who was helped by the Samaritan in order to set the stage for the answer to the second question put to him. 
a parenthesis here. Actually, it's not a parable, a story of the Good Samaritan, but we will not go further than that. At the end of the story, Jesus asks the expert in the law, which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of robbers? Verse 36. To this question, the expert in the law replies, the one who had mercy on him. And Jesus tells him, go and do likewise. And at this time, the, it is the end of the story. Now, how do we bring the first part, the lead question? Teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And the final answer here, go and do likewise. That is the key question we need to ask in this text. And if we take a closer look at this text, we will see why Jesus responded the way he responded. Let's go back to the first question. What must I do to inherit eternal life? Well, I personally find this question as being the fundamental question that anyone would ask. I know that our reading of the narrative is certainly affected by the interpretive notes that accompany the two questions. In the first question, in the first instance, we are told by Luke that the expert in the law stood up to test Jesus. Stood up. Here we have a mixture of feelings. In, in the first instance, the fact that he stood up meant that he was sitting around Jesus because that's the way people were being taught. The rabbi would be sitting and around him would be students, disciples listening to the master, to the rabbi, to the teacher. And this expert sat down to hear Jesus. Sitting down was a sign of respect. And not only that, to ask his question, as some of us will do in Africa, I guess in, in, in Asian countries the same, you stand up with respect to ask the question to the master. So we see already here yielding. But Luke tells us his yielding was couched in some kind of defiance to test Jesus. But the question that he asked, I do believe, was coming from his heart. He's asking, what should I do to inherit eternal life? Here, the question is fundamental for a number of reasons. First, it is the most important question one can ever ask. Brothers and, and, and sisters, you have been, this church has been here 30 years. And the initial reason for the church to be is to bring people to a living relationship with Christ, which means eternal life. If a gathering is formed and they are not asking this question, what can I do to inherit eternal life, then they are not asking the right question. And this person who is asking this question is one who has done everything that the law of Moses requires. But he still wanted to know. He, he had that hunger for eternal life. Brothers and sisters, as we celebrate the 30th anniversary, let us not lose sight of the fact that we are here. Our business is about eternal life. Our business should remain about eternal life. What, what must I do to inherit eternal life? This question is also important because it brings up the distinction between the law of the Old Testament or the understanding of the Old Testament and the new teaching of Jesus Christ. This expert in the law asks, what must 
I do to inherit eternal life. Well, if you look at it, seriously speaking, you don't in, do anything to inherit what is your heritage. You simply need to remain faithful. Because it is your heritage. It's not merit. It is grace. It is grace. And here, there is a nuance that is very important. When you read the Old Testament, nowhere you would find scriptures saying that if you follow the law, if you follow the law, you would have eternal life. No. Scripture always says, I put before you life or death. The Old Testament is about life. And yet when Jesus comes, he changes the message. It becomes not just about life, but it becomes about eternal life. Life without an end. It's a quality of life. Life in communion with God. That is eternal life. And this expert in the law got the nuance. I've been taught about life. You've been teaching about eternal life. Now what must I do to inherit eternal life? And then Jesus returns the question to him. What does the law say? And this expert in the law goes to the core of what scripture says. He takes Jesus to the summary of the entire law of the Old Testament. The law of Moses. They knew that in Israel, these two requirements to summarize the entire law. Love God and love your neighbor. Love God and love your neighbor. And indeed, this uh, expert uh, in the law is even more detailed because he goes into detail of this law. He says, love the Lord God, uh, the, the Lord you God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind. It's not just loving God. It's qualified. It's loving God with, with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength and with all your mind. And then the second, which is equivalent to the first, love your neighbor. And not just love your neighbor. There too, it is qualified. Love your neighbor as yourself. In Ezek. In Ezek. This is the summary of the Old Testament. And Jesus tells him, You have answered correctly. You have answered correctly. And yet this expert in the law asks a new question. And he says, who is my neighbor? And why this question? Why, what is it doing here? Who is my neighbor? And again here, whatever the motivation of the expert, because Luke tells us that he asked this question because he wanted to justify himself. But the, the reality is also that the question of who is my neighbor shows how it is more difficult to love one neighbor than to love God. It is more difficult to love one's neighbor than to love God. Scripture in the New Testament puts it clearly. You know. What are you doing when you say that you love God that you can't see and that you don't see if you don't love your neighbor that you see? It is more difficult to love one's neighbor than to love God. And when he asks this question to Jesus, Jesus wants to give an answer. But to give the answer, he tells the story first, the story of uh, the uh, Good Samaritan, in order for him to set the stage for his answer. And we've read the story. And again, it's not a parable. Scripture doesn't say that it's a parable. It's a story. 
It could have been, it could have been a current event. Something that everybody was talking about. And Jesus brings it to tell a spiritual story. And even, even if it was called a parable, it would not be different because a parable is uh, something material, a story that is in the material realm that teaches a spiritual lesson. Jesus is teaching a spiritual lesson through this story. We have this man stripped of all identity. We don't even know his name. Stripped of all identity. Rendered no one, nothing. Who falls in the hands of robbers. They beat him up. They strip him of his clothes. They steal everything he had. And they leave him for dead. And then Jesus says that two religious people, first a priest and then a Levite, the associates, the helpers of the priest, they happened to pass by that road. They saw the man and they passed by, scripture says, on the other side. Now, let me be clear here. Before we condemn too quickly these two people, they may have good reasons, and Scripture could even give them good reasons. Just to begin with, with Scripture, you know, a rabbi or a Levite could not touch a dead body. If they did, they would be become impure. They would have to go to ritual. So maybe they thought that this man was dead so we couldn't touch him because of our role, because of our functions. But at the second, the second point still with the, with the two religious people, the priest and the, and, and the Levite, they were going to Jerusalem. And we can imagine here that probably they were going to perform their duties. So it's time sensitive. They needed to be there on time. Duty call. Or maybe it was just a practical reason. The road we, we know was very dangerous. So it could have been, at least if it were in Africa, it could have been just a trap. A, get, uh, a, a trap. This man may be faking it, and his friends, the bad guys, are, you know, hiding in the bush. So if you stop to help, his friends will jump on you and do really uh, you harm. So prudence requires that, you know, just don't stop, keep going. So they could have good, had good reasons. But Jesus brings in another person, the Samaritan. What is the difference between the two religious people and the Samaritan? Well, the Samaritan did what is not ex was not expected of him. He saw the opportunity. This man lying there became for him an opportunity to do something. He sees the opportunity. He stopped. He helped. And then he went the extra mile. He did more than what was expected of him. It was good enough to stop and bandage his man's wounds. But it was not even expected of, from him to help this person who was most probably a Jewish person to put him on his donkey to take him to the next town to an uh, innkeeper and to pay for the services at the inn. It was not expected of him. He went the extra mile. And for me, this is key in understanding why Jesus told the story. Because it ties in with his teaching. As a matter of fact, if you read the story in, Mo in Matthew, you'd see that it comes closely after Jesus' teaching uh, in, uh, on the mountain, the Sermon on the Mount. And in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus is telling his disciples and the crowds that you have heard, you were told, do this and don't do that, but I tell you, and every time he said, but I tell you, he was challenging them not to just be happy with doing what was required, but going the extra mile. 
If you love only those who love you, what is extra in this? Even pagans do the same thing. But if you love those who hate you, in this your Father in heaven is glorified. Go the extra mile. Brothers and sisters, there is no ordinary Christian. We are all, we have only extraordinary Christians because they go the extra mile. They do the unexpected. This man did the unexpected. He went the extra mile. Brothers and sisters, we are celebrating the 30th anniversary of Grace Church. But you know, just as we celebrate, our greatest temptation is to be content with the ordinary. We are now used to doing this. The priests were used to going to Jerusalem, to performing their duties, just the ordinary thing. The Levites were used to doing, you know, church, let's call it church, the way they've been doing it. And my fear is that you will settle down with the routine, the tradition, how you have been doing church the last 30 years. But now we are at the crossroads. I want the fire that kindled the beginning of the church to be rekindled for the new generation. And the only way we can do it is to go the extra mile. It should not be just a routine. It should not be just a tradition. But we need to ask ourselves, where is Jesus challenging us? Where is Jesus wanting to take us? What is Jesus wanting us to do? And that's how we can go the extra mile. And here, I ask myself one question in the story. What is the turning point in the story of the Good Samaritan? And for me, I find it in verse 33. Verse 33. The Bible tells us in this verse, in Jesus' story, that this man, the Samaritan, when he came where the man who was beaten up was, verse 33, When he saw him, he came, he saw him, what are we reading? He took pity on him. He came, he saw him, he took pity on him. In other words, something when he saw him, something happened in his heart. And took, take pity here is an expression that is often used in the Gospels for Jesus and Jesus only. So something of divine took place in his heart. It shook him in his heart. He took pity. And that's what we don't read with the others. And here I see coming together this big truth that we have that we cannot do mission, we cannot do evangelism, we cannot do anything that would make a difference if it does not start with the heart. And the work of the heart is the work of God through the Holy Spirit to steer us, to shape us, to mold us. And something in the history of the Alliance Church to which we, the Alliance Alliance to which we belong, from the gate go, one of the distinctives of the Alliance Church is that we bring together deeper life and mission. And I have no shame to say that for the last, you know, how many years we've been active in mission, but we have neglected deeper life, spiritual empowering, and that is a problem. If church becomes just a program, If church becomes just a a necessity, a duty for your family, it doesn't work. It starts with the work of the Holy Spirit to steer us, to shake us up. He took pity on him. And that's what laid him to go the extra mile. Oh, brothers and sisters, as we enter this new phase, I pray that God may fill us 
with the Holy Spirit the way He did 30 years ago, that He may steer us, that He may shape us as we enter this new phase in the history of this church. And then, to end this story, beautiful, Jesus asks the expert in the law, among the three, who was the neighbor to the man who was beaten up. And he said, the one who took pity on him. The same expression that Jesus used. The one who took pity. In other words, Jesus is invited, has invited this man to know that it starts in the heart. And Jesus is doing it even today. That he may shape us. He may steer up us so that we, with this vision that we acquire from this work of the Spirit in us, that we may be allowed to go the extra mile. To go the extra mile. To cross cultural uh, barriers as this man did. To cross our comfort zone, go beyond our comfort zone at work, at the university, at home. Go the extra mile, brothers and sisters. And when each of us will go the extra mile, 30 years from now, people would come and we will celebrate God's goodness because we have kept outside of the thorns. May God help us to go the extra mile in this next leg of the journey for His glory and honor. Amen.